Hello, and welcome back to the Sino Babble podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about a topic that I actually knew nothing about before I discovered it through a random Twitter post a couple of months ago. I follow someone who was talking about a book that they had released that had come out quite recently called Mal's Third Front. The author is a person called Koval Mayskins. And when I say recently, I mean that the book came out a year ago, but in academia, that is actually fairly recent. I was curious because I didn't immediately know what the book was about just from the title. So I took a look at it and I realized that I indeed knew nothing about this topic, the third front. And I had never even heard of the events that had taken place in the book. And I'd never heard the actual phrase, the third front before. So today I want to take a dive into this topic. So this episode is going to be sort of like a book review, but not really. It's a book review in that I'm mainly using this person's book as a resource on this topic. And it's also part historical overview and analysis about this very obscure industrialization movement that took place in the interior of China in the 1960s that no one really ever talks about. I should add that a major reason that I want to talk about this topic is not only because it's part of the grander timeline of our historical analysis of China, but also because it is so obscure. The fact that I've studied China for as long as I have, and I've never even heard of it, I think speaks volumes about the things that we concentrate on most when it comes to China and Chinese history. And so I want this episode to serve as a sort of commentary about historiography and what is considered important or formative and what gets pushed to the sidelines and why. But before we talk about why we may overlook the topic of the Third Front in Chinese history, let's first get an overview of what exactly it was. So, what exactly was the Third Front campaign? Briefly, it was a covert industrialization campaign that promoted the development of heavy industry and military bases in China's interior in case the Cold War should escalate and China should be invaded by its enemies. It ran between 1964 and 1962, basically encompassing the third and fourth year plans and reflecting the international relations and developmental concerns of China's leaders following the collapse of the Great Leap Forward and the start of the Cultural Revolution. Major projects in steel, coal, railways and military equipment were undertaken in order to develop the parts of the nation that were considered most vulnerable to invasion from China's neighbours and could form a good bulwark of resistance. The movement was launched in August of 1964 in response to the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which is usually recognised as the entry point of the USA into the Vietnam War. This is when Mao was able to gain support from other party leaders as the threat of war seemed much more imminent and therefore deserved prioritisation above economic recovery and agricultural production. This then had a knock-on effect on the third five-year plan, which switched focus from material incentives and consumption to heavy industry and mass mobilisation, both of which had been taboo since the Great Leap Forward. This project wasn't a complete revival of the Great Leap Forward, as it was much more covert, but still had a similar spirit in that labourers were expected to be completely devoted to socialism, and the primary aim was to industrialise. The campaign even revived some of the projects from the Great Leap Forward. But overall, the campaign was much more highly centralised and focused on China's interior, unlike the Great Leap Forward, which sought to develop the entire nation. The Third Front took place over two phases. The first phase concentrated on southern and western provinces such as Sichuan, Gansu and Yunnan, and the second phase saw the focus shift to the northwest and central provinces such as Hunan, Hebei, Shanxi and Gansu. The Third Front campaign gradually declined after 1972, when relations with the US improved following Nixon's visit to China and the introduction of economic policies in the 1980s that favoured the coast, again put the interior on the back burner for development and investment. By analysing the Third Front campaign and bringing it into a more mainstream understanding of 20th century Chinese history, I think we have the opportunity to shift our perspective on China's developmental course and possibly correct some of the deeply held assumptions that we have about how and why policy decisions were made. In his book, Mao's Third Front, Mayskins writes that, quote, 
The geopolitical antagonisms of the Cold War deeply shaped Communist Party efforts to re-engineer China into a socialist industrial nation, and that international security concerns militarised government attempts to make China modern from the late Qing into the Mao era. In other words, he argues that China's modernization was driven by mainly external security concerns, and in the case of the Third Front, the threats that emerged as the Cold War developed and the relationship between China and the Soviet Union broke down. This analysis allows us to shift from our usual view of using a social lens to view Chinese history, by which I mean looking mainly at bottom-up internal politics, social movements and socialist campaigns, even when discussing explicitly external events like the Sino-Soviet split. I suppose the fact that it was a covert campaign is a large part of the reason that it remains relatively undiscussed today when we talk about general Chinese history. It helps that China was never actually invaded during the course of the Cold War, and so many of the preparations made went unused, and the interior fell back into obscurity and poverty from the 1980s onwards. However, it is true that the Cold War as a factor in and of itself is rarely used by historians of China, and conversations about the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution tend to dominate the history of the 60s and 70s, along with internal factional disputes and occasional discussions of external relations, but again through a Maoist lens. We've even discussed at length on this podcast how China was bruised from the Great Leap Forward, had lost the Soviet Union as a major ally, and was threatened on all sides by major powers participating in the Cold War. While there have been more studies in the Chinese language on the Third Front, even those haven't really penetrated into Western scholarship, despite the fact that Chinese scholars obviously have more access to archival documents than we do. But even Chinese scholars focus on the Cultural Revolution as the defining policy of the 60s and 70s, which is a shame because Maskins argues that inland industrialization and the shift away from consumer production to heavy industry in the Cold War era was actually a result of the Third Front. Quote, Afraid that the United States or the Soviet Union could demolish Chinese industry with a few air raids or nuclear strikes, nearly 400 state-owned enterprises were moved from coastal cities to clandestine mountain locations. So this explains why there is so much industry in the interior of China today, much of which is considered sort of like a rust belt, although the railways are still in use. Maskins also argues that the socialist fervour and dedication to Mao and the aims of building the new Chinese nation were central to the campaign. People who took part in the campaign were supposed to give up everything to be part of it, and be grateful that they had been recruited to take part. It kind of reminds me of the Virgin Lands campaign that was promoted in the Soviet Union by Khrushchev in the 1950s, It was supposed to be like the start of a new life, a wonderful life that would bring benefit to the self, the nation, and to socialism. So in this sense, the Third Front also serves as another event for us to analyse the dynamics of Maoist politics in the 60s and 70s, meaning that we're not solely reliant on the Cultural Revolution as the only reference point for understanding the push towards a more fundamentalist and extreme version of socialism. In general, the Third Front campaign is important for understanding the politics of mass mobilisation, as well as how power worked in the CCP leadership at this time. We've actually covered a lot of the context for the development of the Third Front campaign and the political atmosphere of the early 1960s over the past few episodes. So, for example, we already know that China was under great economic stress following the collapse of the Great Leap Forward. And the international situation had become fraught due to the collapse of Sino-Soviet relations and increasing tensions with the US following the second Taiwan Strait crisis. However, the Third Front campaign was not launched immediately after these events took place. While the Minister of National Defence, Lin Biao, had suggested relocating industry and military units to inland mountains as early as 1960 to prepare the country for the prospect of war, Realistically, the other party members were no longer interested in a heavy industry approach to economic development. Even Mao only really started backing the idea in 1964, when he reviewed the third five-year plan put forward by Liu Xiaoqi and his allies in the party, criticising it for being too lax when it came to China's security concerns, 
and once again showing that he feared China was heading down the same revisionist path as the Soviet Union under Khrushchev by embracing more capitalistic tendencies. But again, the other leaders didn't really see the need for heavy industry at a time when consumption and living standards were at an all-time low. This was reflected in their first draft of the third five-year plan, which was released for revision in 1964, which allocated 20% of investment to agriculture, as opposed to the 11.3% that it had received during the Great Leap Forward. National defence and industrialization were seen as secondary concerns to improving the quality of goods and providing people with daily essentials. But Mao was insistent that industry, mass mobilisation and the militarisation of the people to work for the spirit of socialism instead of material incentives was the true way. He was inspired by success stories such as the Daqing oil field in Heilongjiang province, which, despite a lack of funding, had managed to mobilise 50,000 workers in a battle to set up infrastructure. The oil ministry had successfully mobilised the people by promoting the works of Mao in order to inspire the labourers to work selflessly, which surprisingly actually worked, and it led to Daqing becoming one of the main suppliers for China's oil industry in the following years, and also allowing it to become self-sufficient after it had cut itself off from the Soviet Union. But other party leaders were still ambivalent. One example like Daqing wasn't really enough to convince them of the need for these mass mobilisation politics again. Mao continued to harass his fellow leaders on the issue throughout May and June of 1964, berating leading economic planner Li Fuchun for acting like a Soviet-style planner and insisting that a major steelworks be built in Panjihua, all the way out in southwestern Sichuan, Otherwise, he would ride a donkey there himself and basically start building it from scratch. But they remained unconvinced. That was until fighting broke out between Vietnam and US troops stationed in the Gulf of Tonkin on August 4th, 1964. Protests were launched in China supporting the Vietnamese people and condemning the aggression of the imperialist US. Suddenly, everyone was taking the threat of war, particularly with the USA, more seriously. By August 12th, for example, Zhou Enlai had already approved a plan to mobilise 240,000 workers to construct railroads in Sichuan and Yunnan between Chengdu and Kunming, and other interprovincial railroads between Yunnan and Guizhou and Sichuan and Guizhou. So, the Third Front campaign had finally gained official backing. But how was it supposed to develop and take shape? The basic plan was developed by China's military strategists, who at the time basically comprised of Mao and Lin Biao, after coming to a realisation that China would not be able to hold off an invasion either via land or by sea. China's military situation was pretty dire in the early 1960s, especially compared with the other major powers in the region. It had a large army, but it was not technologically up to date. It had basically no naval or air support, and though it had successfully tested nuclear weapons, it had no mechanism of delivery, and wouldn't until the early 1970s. If China's first front, namely its coastal cities, were invaded, then PLA troops would have to retreat to a second front away from the coast, nearer to Suzhou, and then, if necessary, a third front in China's interior, where they could wage a protracted land war. At least, that was the plan. In order to pull this tactic off, advanced preparations would need to be made so that the PLA could operate self-sufficiently for a long period of time, and survive in China's mountains even if the rest of the country were being bombarded with nuclear weapons. It was a sort of survival at all costs methodology, reflecting the guerrilla tactics that the CCP had developed in the 1930s and 40s during the Long March and the subsequent civil war with the KMT. A message was circulated to all central ministries, provinces and cities on August 19th, 1964, stating that the Third Front construction was to be carried out with immediate effect, with each ministry given responsibility for certain projects, as well as orders for more work units, such as research and design institutions, to also prepare to move inland, while industrialization projects on China's coastal areas were either to be halted or reduced in scale. <laughs> 
These plans reflected a change in the party's planning apparatus to an appeasement of Mao and the desire to fulfil his request to get the construction of the Third Front up and running on as large a scale as possible as soon as possible. Mao was belligerent on issues of planning, stating that if construction could begin, then it should, and that targets and projections set by the planning commission were either too small or too slow. Li Fuchun, who was in charge of the planning commission at the time, began openly denouncing the Soviet model, bashing wasteful bureaucratic and administrative expenditure, and promoting the idea of mass mobilisation despite a lack of material resources. It seems that Liu Xiaoqi, at least, remained somewhat cautious, confiding in Li Fuchun that, quote, We must advocate being honest, speaking honest words and doing honest things. When we set up an economic plan, we must not let honest people suffer. It seemed like he was fearing a return to the excesses of the Great Leap Forward more than anything else, which was really fair enough, considering that the country still hadn't fully recovered from that disaster yet, and just a few years later, here was Mao planning an entirely new, grand and idealistic construction project. By 1965, Mao's frustration with the pace of the campaign boiled over, and he ended up replacing the planning commission, which was headed by Li and worked on by Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping and others that we've discussed in previous episodes, replacing them with people whose vision was more in line with his own. He appointed Yu Qi Li, the man who had overseen the construction of the Daqing oil field, as the head of the third five-year plan and, ostensibly, the Third Front campaign. He also appointed Zhou Enlai and a few other ministry heads to form a small planning committee and work alongside Yu. As such, construction was able to get started right away, commencing with the first phase in the southwestern provinces of Sichuan, Yunnan and Guizhou by the end of 1964, and seriously picking up the pace throughout 1965. The plan for development in these regions was broken down into several phases. First, they all had to be connected, which meant that previously disparate railway lines had to be joined up. Then the plan was to build industrial infrastructure to produce energy and create mines. The plan was to build one complex between Chongqing and Guizhou, and another around the Panjihua Steelworks in southwestern Sichuan. By 1965, the first complex had set up three military electrical engineering factories, as well as 74 machinery enterprises an aluminium smelter, and an entire rubber industry, which were completed in 1970. In the northwest, the provinces of Gansu, Ningxia, and Qinghai were also brought into the campaign, with a drive being made for the construction of new steel mills and dams for producing power. The Panjihua Iron and Steel Complex was one of the largest projects ever undertaken in China, even during the Great Leap Forward. This was the project that Mao was obsessed with, the one where he had threatened to ride a donkey to get there in order to get it all started. Some 100,000 workers and 700 factories were mobilised to help with the construction of both the works itself and the connecting railway, power facilities and new cities that were going to house the prospective workers. The area was meant to produce machinery both for military use and for general industrial use. Much of the work was completed between 1966 and 1970 at great expense. The first phase of building the Panjihua complex and iron mine cost 3.74 billion yuan. The Changdu Kunming Railway cost 3.3 billion, and the coal mining complex in Guizhou cost over a billion yuan. This is in relation to the total state allocation for construction for 1965 and 1966, which was 16 billion and 19 billion yuan, respectively. The pace of construction for these projects did slow down when the Cultural Revolution broke out in 1966, meaning that progress was slow throughout 1967 and 68. But, in the end, the southwest region had been all connected up by the early 1970s, and some production had actually gone underway. The running of the campaign hinged mainly on the successful relocation of both entire factories and large numbers of personnel and workers to major third front locations. Factories were to be moved wholesale, including their water, gas and electricity lines, as well as all of their equipment, 
Displaced factories, usually on China's major coastal cities, were then expected to replace the workers and materials that they had lost using their own ingenuity. As for personnel, mobilisation efforts focused first on making sure that those involved in the Third Front were dedicated to the cause. Political thought work was carried out at every level so that workers would take Mao's strategic thought as the guiding principle, teach employees to consider the big picture, resolutely obey the needs of the country, and take pride in supporting Third Front construction. Interestingly, the party urged those in charge of recruitment not to downplay how difficult life would be at the front, and instead focus on engaging those with a revolutionary spirit. Potential recruits were exposed to propaganda at mobilisation meetings held in work units or in communes, especially in cases where people were encouraged to sign up voluntarily instead of being recruited directly. Much of the propaganda was focused on the need to defend the motherland against potential invading forces and the looming threat of imperialism. A certain degree of steadfastness was necessary, as often the recruits didn't even know where they were going or how long they would be gone for, bearing in mind the majority of people at this time rarely left their hometowns or regions. They were not permitted to speak about their recruitment openly, as technically the Third Front was a covert campaign, and this was reflected by the remote and often even unmapped locations that they were being transferred to. Those recruited for the campaign were seen as sort of a special breed, at least by the central authorities. Party leaders had demanded that only good people and good horses be sent to the Third Front, which included many skilled urban workers and excluded certain political groups such as former landlords and capitalists. They also had to meet certain physical standards, and those with better educational backgrounds, for example technical school graduates and military officers, were given priority. Some of these stricter standards were relaxed later, probably due to personnel shortages, especially for civilian roles. Many workers were not happy with their forced relocation, as, shockingly, in most cases it was seen as a mandatory move. Once you were called up to the Third Front, you had to leave the worldly comforts of city life and up sticks with your family to live in the mountains to become devoted Maoists labouring entirely for the socialist cause. This applied to high-ranking directors in factories or design and research institutes as much as it did those who would be working on the factory floor. Those who refused to move risked losing their employment in state-owned enterprises as well as their CCP membership if they had one. Unsurprisingly, those who lived in the most developed parts of the country, such as Shanghai, resented having to go down market to places that they had heard were either too hot or too cold, where the people were worked to the bone and the living conditions were terrible. They didn't want their families to suffer or their children to miss out on educational opportunities. Though rural workers recruited for the Third Front often didn't have to go that far to work on projects, Communes often resented relocating labour as they were not compensated by the state but were actually expected to give labourers extra work points regardless. Some rural residents mistakenly thought that a war had already broken out and tried desperately to make sure that their children weren't marched off to what they thought were the front lines of battle. However, there were some people who thought that moving to the Third Front would give them a better life, especially as the government was so focused on promoting the scheme. Rural workers called up to the Third Front were much more inclined to go, as, from a socio-economic perspective, even moving to a remote location would be seen as a step up if they got to work in a state-owned enterprise and live even in the smallest urban area, therefore changing their hukou status. The second phase of the campaign kicked off in 1969, as many of the projects of the first phase were reaching their completion and new areas were being incorporated into the Third Front. More western central regions in Hunan, Hubei, Shanxi and Shanxi provinces were selected to form another military industrial region to be interconnected via rail, utilities and new industrial projects, which would then also go on to be connected to the southwestern parts of the first phase of the project. The first railway lines were completed in 1970, thanks to the mobilisation of hundreds of thousands of workers. At one point, the number of people working on the railways reached two people per one metre of track. 
Most of the railways were completed by 1973, but the power projects were less successful. While a Soviet design dam was able to be utilised, the Gurjoba Dam in Hubei province, which was begun construction in 1970, was not actually completed until 1988, well after the Third Front had come to a close. This second phase of the project was less focused on materials and more focused on machinery, the most important undertaking being the building of the number two automobile plant in Xi'an in Hubei province. Once again, whole factories, their parts and personnel were relocated from other areas, with more than 140 factories, design and research facilities put to work on completing the plant. While the new plant was designed by native engineers and the machinery used domestically produced, it did rely heavily on assistance from workers and managers from the number one auto factory, which had been built in Changchun with Soviet assistance in the 1950s. Many of the factories built in Hubei were directly related to the running of this automobile plant, including rubber and tyre, paint and bearing factories. Other operations were set up in the other main provinces from this phase, but little is known about them, which suggests that their production was mainly military in nature. This would make sense, as the threat from the Soviet Union was perceived to have increased during this period, and the fear of invasion was reflected in the way that many factories were built, either deep in the mountainous areas or dug into caves, with the number two automobile plant itself being scattered throughout a 32 kilometre area containing more than 20 workshops. The northwestern provinces also took part in the second phase of the campaign, mainly by taking advantage of the cloning of factories and enterprises that had already been established in the northeast. Factories were moved across from Harbin and Changchun in Heilongjiang and Jilin provinces to Longxi and Tianshui in Gansu province. One whole plant called the Great Wall Machinery Plant was moved from Beijing to Ningxia. This was probably the period of the most intensive investment in infrastructure and industry in the northwestern region of China, possibly to date. But the highs of the Third Front campaign came to an abrupt end after 1971, as many of the projects were cancelled or suspended, and many of the work teams either returned to their previous positions or relocated to projects in eastern China. There were a number of internal and external factors that contributed to this sudden shift in priorities. From an international perspective, the threat of war had lessened as China had begun its own rapprochement with the US that culminated with Nixon's visit to China in 1972. Minister of National Defence and driving force behind the campaign, Lin Biao, had met a sudden and tragic fate in 1971, which is honestly a topic for a whole different episode, and in general the campaign was running into financial difficulties that would make it untenable to continue in the long run. The amount of resources needed for the campaign were putting a strain on food and other consumables, once again putting China on the brink of crisis as had happened with the Great Leap Forward. But despite its short-lived nature and overall shortcomings, this isn't to say that the Third Front campaign achieved nothing at all. So, the Third Front had had a significant impact on the state's financial and planning capacity during its roughly eight-year high. So just to briefly recap like how much it cost, during the third five-year plan from 1966 to 1970, investment in the Third Front was roughly 52% of total national investment, and from 1971 to 75, which is the fourth five-year plan, it took up between 40 and 44% of national investment. Around 1,800 large and medium industrial enterprises were constructed by 1981 out of a national total of 5,000, and about 200 research institutes were set up. Some studies estimate that during its peak years, at least two-thirds of state industrial investment was going towards third front construction. So did this investment pay off? The campaign did have some major achievements, many of which would probably have been necessary for China's long-term development anyway. It linked up previously relatively inaccessible areas together via railway links, allowed for the extraction and use of previously underutilised natural resources, and set up some industrial and manufacturing bases that would continue to provide material resources and jobs to the areas that had been developed. 
However, these achievements were somewhat limited by the fact that most of the projects were built far away from existing urban or just generally populated areas, and so were of no use to those people and were generally expensive to set up without actually creating new economic centres. It didn't help that a lot of the work was not properly planned and therefore shoddily carried out. The push to get everything done as soon as possible in the face of impending war meant that cracks literally started appearing in major projects almost as soon as they were completed. The huge Gongzui Dam of South Chengdu developed fissures in the dam's face shortly after construction so that the reservoir could never be completely filled and the dam generated only partial power until the 1980s. Over the course of the 1980s, 40 million yuan was spent on fixing problem spots on the Chengdu Kunmin railway line and while the first trains were able to run through the Chongqing Xiangfang line in October 1973, the line was cut by multiple cave-ins in 1974 and would therefore not be fully functional until 1978. In general, billions of yuan were wasted on projects that were never even completed. Even though Chinese planners, engineers, scientists and technicians were able to prove that they could work without the help of the Soviet Union, their progress was undercut by poor economic planning, fundamental design failures and rushed targets. This wasn't helped by the remote nature of the majority of projects, even those that were supposed to be interconnected and provided vital parts for each other. Because of their disparate nature, it was difficult to get all the parts, say, for building a car or a truck, sent to the right place in a timely manner, without a lot of logistics and a lot of time wasted. These disparate factories often didn't communicate very well during the campaign itself, and so they were not really able to naturally develop links that would stimulate economic growth and production after the Third Front was over, rendering them essentially useless in the long run. And let's not forget that the Third Front pulled investment away from other areas too, including sectors that had actually been growing or had already been profitable and successful particularly along China's coast and in the northeast. But more than its physical achievements or failures, I think for us, looking at it from a historical perspective in any case, the Third Front campaign is more important as an event more than it is as a political or economic or social movement in and of itself. It's very useful for adding further context to discussions about the Cultural Revolution when we eventually get there as the launch of that movement was also part of Mao's vision for how socialism should be carried out and what bad elements needed to be eradicated from society in order for that dream to be fulfilled. The Third Front campaign was a highly militarised campaign, not just in its concerns, i.e. building up a bulwark against invasion, but also in the language used to discuss the project and the way in which labour was mobilised in order to complete projects. According to Maskins, those participating in the campaign were expected to behave like soldiers during wartime, not like workers during a 9-to-5 shift. The Chinese leadership saw China in another race with Western powers, much like they had been during the Great Leap Forward, but this time it was a race against what they perceived to be truly existential threats, imperialism and revisionism, which had the possibility of manifesting in actual invasion. It wasn't just about building socialism, it was also about defending it. The Cultural Revolution was almost like an internalised version of the Third Front. This time the enemies were within and they needed to be rooted out, but the conspiracy-like atmosphere remained basically the same. The Third Front, along with other campaigns initiated by Mao at this time, were a reflection of his own ambitions to create the country in the image that he imagined, while also protecting that perfect image from the enemies that necessarily surrounded him at all times. When Deng Xiaoping took over the running of the country after the death of Mao and the ousting of his successor, Hua Guofeng, any attempts at revitalising the Third Front were abandoned completely. The austerity mindset of produce first, consume later was dropped in favour of a system that would allow at least some people to get rich first and then hopefully lift the country out of its poverty, allowing for industrialization and urbanization to take place side by side. 
The Third Front campaign was a reflection most of all of Mao's anxieties about international relations and his own desires to see China at the forefront of the socialist world instead of the revisionist Soviet Union, two goals that were tossed completely to the side under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping. To me, the Third Front kind of reads like a false start for another Great Leap Forward, as I kind of get the feeling that had it actually succeeded, Mao would have felt fully redeemed and carried out a similar plan that encompassed the whole nation. But alas, it wasn't meant to be. Not only had the tides of the Cold War changed by the time the Third Front campaign petered out, but the main architect of the plan, Lin Biao, passed away in 1971, and Mao himself passed away in 1976, meaning that the true driving forces behind the campaign were all gone by the time the Cultural Revolution was coming to a close. As Maskins puts it, quote, As the likelihood of a great power war faded into the background, the CCP ceased depicting taking up arms and defending the country in a battle as the responsibility of every citizen. No longer worried about a major assault on Chinese territory, the CCP required only a small number of people to serve in militias, and it did not demand that they engage in regular military drills and prepare to fight off international enemies. With the abandonment of big militarised industrialization campaigns, the CCP gave up its policy of treating consumer austerity as a necessary feature of building socialist industrial modernity in China. The government also no longer denounced material incentives and asserted that their use was a revisionist or bourgeois practice that generated social stratification and made people value their individual interests more than the collective project of making China into a socialist industrial nation. In what Deng Xiaoping significantly called China's new era of peace and development, building Chinese socialism was no longer equated with a flat social structure nor was it associated with material ascetism for the sake of expanding China's industrial base and strengthening its defence apparatus. The advancement of Chinese socialism was instead identified with rising standards of living, and material incentives were viewed as a way to achieve this goal by increasing labour productivity, stimulating efficiency, enhancing quality control, and promoting innovation in response to market signals. So that's it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed learning about this topic, which I knew, like I said, nothing about before I had read this book. Like I said, you can go ahead and purchase Covell Maskin's book. It's called Mouse Third Front, and it's available on Amazon. I believe it's also available in Kindle form if you wanted to know more in depth about it. Don't forget that you can sign up for the Sinobabble newsletter by going to the website and entering your email address, or by going to Substack and searching for Sinobabble. The most recent newsletter is all about the closure of the Apple Daily newspaper in Hong Kong, and how Hong Kong has changed since the introduction of the national security law last year. You can also make a donation to the Sinobabble podcast by going to the website and clicking on the donate button. You can make a one-off or monthly donation depending on how you feel. Any and every donation is greatly appreciated. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you tune in next time.